<laughs> yeah, I'm trying to. I'm trying to look different, do something, something. Yeah. Never... Welcome, welcome to the Mustache Club. Okay, are we what? live? <laughs> yes. Are we, we are live now. Parag, we are live. So it's on YouTube, but I think the other channel will set up. Okay. Yeah, we're going to be live in a minute. Okay, I think we'll just wait for that. Raj Gopal sir, you can see well, no? Yeah, yeah, it's perfect. Yeah. Raj Gopal sir, is that the anti-COVID uh, moustache look? Or? <laughs> uh, I have no idea, Sharan. <laughs> I, 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 I always wanted to try and see what this looks like, so <laughs> give him the opportunity to do that. Okay, we are live. Okay, perfect. So, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to the uh, fifth uh, ski webinar. And this is a very interesting webinar, which is going to be conducted uh, by Dr. Ashok Rajgopal. And he has put up some very interesting cases on complex TKRs and revision TKRs. But before uh, we go on to uh, the cases, uh, before we go on to the cases, I we would request Dr. Sachin Tapasi to give a talk and he's going to speak to us on implants in complex TKR and revision TKRs. How do you choose? How do you decide the level of constraint? So this would be a talk for approximately 15 minutes and then we go to the cases which will be presented by Dr. Ashok Rajgopal. We have a, a very interesting faculty. We have Dr. Vijay Bose. We have Adarsh Reddy. Uh, we have Mukesh Ladda, Jacob Vargis, Vikash Kapoor uh, and Sharan Patil. With, and it's Sharan's birthday, so happy birthday, Sharan. And on that note, over to Sachin Tapaswi. Yes, uh, thank you, Parag. And uh, Sharan, a very happy birthday. So we'll sing you a song at the end of uh, today's thank webinar. You, and uh, we'll expect a virtual... Uh, <laughs> Don't embarrass me, well. thank you. Okay. Right, so as an introduction <laughs> to today's uh, webinar, which is essentially going to be dealing with... Uh, issues of uh, complex primary and revision situations, especially related to instability and how do you reconstruct bone and how do you compensate or reconstruct ligaments. We thought it apt to just have a small introductory presentation to lead up to the same. So one of the important aspects that we always use in our, in all our uh, sort of surgeries, which are away from the standard mild to moderate deformity is the role of constraint. And Stability is absolutely essential if we want to have a long-term mm -hmm. functioning totally replacement, which is completely important. Any instability is a major cause of failure. So if you look at the current data that we have, knee instability accounts for the second most common reason for revision in today's scenario. So recent papers would quote that probably instability has gone a notch higher than infection. Of course, this is the data that has been quoted by all the Western literature. I think in our country, probably infection is still the major cause of revision, but uh, although instability is not lagging far behind. So what's, what are the different tricks and tips that we use to encounter instability? Of course, reconstruction of bone is an important aspect. And the other major aspect of it is to try and compensate for any form of ligament laxity there would be. What the thing that we use quite often is constraint. And what do we mean by constraint? Constraint is essentially the level of mechanical support that we use to provide a stable functional knee. So this constraint could be very low as in a semi-constrained knee like a CR knee, or it could be very high like a rotating hinge. And of course we have a huge spectrum of constraint that lies from the mobile bearing sort of partial knee, which is a non-constrained implant to a rotating hinge. And that's what we'll try and understand in the next couple of minutes. Why do we require constraint? As I just mentioned, I think key vital structures are not uh, sort of doing their proper role. And I think we need to do something more. And this is where these soft tissue laxity will be then compensated by certain mechanical implant characteristics in the implant, which bring about this constraint. These, <coughs> sorry, these essentially will accommodate the loss of support which is there in the current scenario that you're dealing with. When should we do it? I think there are three main indications. When you are not able to balance your flexion and extension gap, and it is usually the flexion gap 
which is uh, the problem rather than the extension gap. The second indication is mid flexion instability, which uh, I would not say is a new concept, but is a definitely well recognized concept. And I think with uh, increasing number of knee replacements, there's a higher chance that we will start identifying more and more patients who are not happy because they have mid flexion instability. And lastly, we're going to be looking at the cases of global instability, especially following trauma or infections, or if you've done a tumor resection, which seriously compromise the insertion points of your collateral ligaments. How do you achieve constraint? I think the most common way that we do it is that we increase the central post in the cam and post mechanism, and we make it higher and wider, and thereby we achieve constraint with the help of a non-linked high central post. When we require more constraint, we just make this high central post linked. We link it with the femoral component, and what we use is a linked hinge rotating platform. It is extremely unusual, and it is not at all common where we use just a linked hinge without a rotating platform because of the unacceptable sort of rate of loosening. So essentially, our main focus is going to be on the constrained non-hinged implant. So essentially what this is, is it's a tall post in the middle of your uh, plastic insert, which mates with the cam of your femoral component. It's a large central post, it substitutes predominantly for the LCL. And if you have minor to moderate degrees of MCL laxity, it may help substitute for the same as well. This is very important to understand that a PS knee is not a constrained knee. A PS knee acts as a semi-constrained knee because the height of the post is not large enough to compensate for a defunct or non-functioning LCL or a compromised MCL. So the main indication is MCL attenuation. I purposefully put a star on MCL deficiency. If the MCL is completely deficient, you cannot use this non-hinged constraint implant. LCL attenuation or LCL deficiency is the more common indication where we use it. And when we are left with a flexion gap laxity, I think there is a role for this particular insert to be used. So let's look at this 73 year old lady uh, with a normal BMI. She's got a deformity which is partially, which is not passively correctable. You can see on the x-rays that this is somewhat of a type three valgus. And she required a complete release of all her soft tissues on the lateral side. And we can see here that we've sort of elevated all the tissues from the lateral side, released it right down, and we were able to achieve correction. But of course, we had to protect the lateral side by the attenuated lateral side, which we had to release completely with the help of a constrained prosthesis. And that's her three-year post-op follow-up. So a constrained prosthesis, what is important, which does not have a hinge, is that you, it will provide rotational constraint. And what you need to understand is what is called as a cam hop height. And this hop height is going to determine what sort of jump height your prosthesis has got, which makes it completely stable during the arc of flexion extension. Some systems which, or most of the systems will allow a continuum of constraint, like what I've demonstrated here, the bearing increases from a standard CR to a PS to a PS plus to a SSK PS, which has further increased, not just in height, but in width as well, to a completely sort of varus valgus constraint where it completely fills up the femoral cam, thereby achieving a good stability in a stable reconstruction. So the predominant indications for using a varus valgus constraint in the primary TKR would be a valgus osteoarthritis with an incompetent MCL, a severe flexion deformity where you're not able to balance the flexion extension gaps, bone defects which are especially uncontained which cause compromise of your collaterals. If you have an extra articular deformity in certain situations, you may require to use them. If you have varus valgus laxity which is more than five millimeters, throughout the range of motion. I think that again is an important indication. And these are some uncommon indications where you have rheumatoid arthritis, especially in valgus, where you've got neuropathic arthropathy, poliomyelitis, or an uncontrollable flexion extension gap balance. These will be uncommon indications for the same. 
Midflexion instability, which is not recognized at the time of initial surgery and which presents with uh, pain, laxity and instability later on, again, will require revision to the use of a VVC or a varus valgus constrict implant. A simple PS implant will not be sufficient because the post in a simple PS implant still has rotational freedom, still in flexion, it is going to be a shallow box. The articular congruity is not going to be as much as what it will be with a VVC type of an implant. And usually these patients will have a deficient anterior thought of the MCL and they require sort of a revision to a more constrained varus valgus support. And this requires, in my opinion, a non-hinged constrained implant like the VVC. Another example here, this is a revision scenario. Uh, this is the second stage which has been done. And uh, with the help of non-constrained implants, one can see that this is not a knee that is stable throughout the range of motion. The medial side, the lateral side structures are definitely lax in this case. And this requires the presence of uh, again revision with the help of a constrained implant. And this was the final follow-up at the end of five years with good flexion and extension. We then come to the next uh, degree of constraint, which is the hinge rotating platform. I don't think in today's world, there is much role of using a non-rotating hinge. We have to use a rotating hinge so that we are able to give our patients better function, better stability, and less loosening. The major indications, I think, the most common indication is a hyperextension type of instability, which may be neuropathic. And the other indications may be when you have complete loss of the MCL, there is no choice, but we have to go to a rotating hinge. If you have global instability, either because of soft tissue destruction or because of segmental bone loss, that again becomes an important indication to use a rotating hinge. Here is one such example of a patient who had a primary knee done in poliomyelitis. Unfortunately, the surgeon did not recognize the amount of hyperextension and his poor soft tissues. This led to the whole knee feeling completely globally unstable and required revision to a rotating hinge type of a prosthesis. So again, to sort of reiterate the indications to use a rotating hinge in the primary scenario will be if you have bone loss, if you have severe bone deformity, fractures, neuropathic joints such as uh, poliomyelitis and sort of uh, advanced recurvatum. How are the long-term results of these rotating hinge? I think if you look at the cumulative incidence of aseptic uh, loosening and all failures, they do pretty well, around 5% aseptic loosening at 10 years and almost about 20% uh, loosening at 10 years. Mind you, only 18% were done for a primary situation then. Another good paper that came out of the Rush group in which they looked at uh, 80 rotating hinges uh, and it formed the survivorship was almost about 71% at the end of five years. So you have to choose your implants with care. I mean, I don't think you should be unnecessarily doing advanced constraint. You have to choose and pick and evaluate your amount of instability and look at it. Thus, these are some comparative data of papers that have been published on the use of rotating hinges, both in the revision and the primary scenario. And what we see here is that they have decent survival. Of course, you have to look at your indications properly and that will help you achieve a good functional outcome. So I think to conclude, constraint is an important aspect in our armamentarium when we're dealing with uh, total joint replacements. It's important to understand that you should use the least amount of constraint as what is required for that particular case. If you use a higher constraint than what is required, it could be a bit of overkill because the higher you go with constraint, your function will certainly drop your mobility or the satisfaction rates are going to drop slightly. So that's why you have to use the correct amount of constraint as you feel comfortable. It's important to understand that if you use a high PS post like a VVC type of an implant, you're going to fulfill majority of solutions that you encounter both in complex primary as well as revenge surgeries. And if you have to salvage a bad knee, which has come very unstable, or if you have a multiply operated knee, then I think rotating hinge will be the go-to for uh, in, your, uh, in your surgical treatment. So this friends was a brief overview, which is going to lead up to the interesting cases that we have uh, here to come. And I turn it over to uh, Dr. Parak Sanchiti 
and Dr. Ashok Rajgopal for the subsequent interesting cases on which all of us will have a good discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, uh, Sachin. That was a nice talk to lay the platform for the cases. Uh, uh, while I just put up the presentation for Dr. Ashok Rajgopal, sir, uh, there's just one question on mid-flexion instability. Yes. The question is uh, uh, how to examine mid-flexion instability intraoperatively and uh, in the clinic once the patient comes for a follow-up. So while you answer that, I'll just set up the talk. Okay. So each one will have his own trick as to how he looks for mid-flexion instability. Essentially, the way I do it intraoperatively is that uh, if I'm doing a PS knee, I'll put a simple CR insert. Or if I'm doing a CR knee, I'll put a flat insert. I won't put in a lift insert. And then I will take the knee through a range of motion. And much like how you do a pivot shift test when we're examining uh, ACL, I will do a similar kind of test and check for instability in the mid ranges. And that gives me a fair clue uh, whether my knee is going to be unstable in the mid ranges. Also, if there is enough laxity, especially in the AP plane, when you're closer towards 90 degree of flexion, that will suspect me that the patient has got mid flexion instability. Post-operatively, I think one of the major telltale signs that the patient will give you is that they find it very uncomfortable coming downstairs, especially, and they keep on having these painless effusions or effusions which keep on bothering them whenever they have done extra activity. When you examine these patients closely, they will have an effusion, they have diffuse tenderness, and when you examine them in a sort of, when you sort of try and move the knee side to side, you may feel the slight juggle, which is then what would suspect you to have a mid-flexion instability. So Parag, that's how I usually yeah, evaluate perfect. my patients intra and post-op. So if anyone on the panel has got a few other tricks that they would like to share, We'll be more than happy to hear from them as to how they yeah. evaluate their mid flexion instead. Anybody wants to just give a quick answer of their assessment before we go on to the cases? Uh, so, uh, uh, Parag, uh, one, one of the things that I find very useful is um, if you hang the leg over the side of your examining couch yeah. and put your finger, uh, put your forearm under the lower end of the thigh, just above the knee. Uh, and try and distract the knee joint, a patient with a subtle instability will complain of a, a distinct feeling of discomfort. And uh, these patients are often uh, known to say that that's the kind of feeling that they get when they are trying to come downstairs. You know, the point that uh, Sachin just made, because subtle instabilities are present more, far more commonly than we actually uh, diagnose and give uh, give them credit for a lot of these patients who are unhappy. I believe are flexion unstable. Okay, perfect. So, so do you mind if I just uh, mention how we do it intraoperatively at Sunshine? Sure, others. Pretty simple procedure. We just take the ball of the foot uh, in the uh, palm of the hand uh, after we put our inserts, and at 30 degrees, 60 degrees, and 90 degrees, we just rotate the foot and then we just see if it's popping out or not. So that's just a quick way to see in our 10 commandments. That's one of the steps that we check. But, you know, popping out takes a lot of uh, force other. So, you know, that may not be really directly indicative of uh, a mid flexion instability. Parag, uh, it, it, I would tell you that something once. is wrong and uh, uh, you know, that will definitely make you think. And that is the time you can actually correct that mistake. Yeah. Parag, can yes. I just add to what yes. he has said? Yes. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, please, Parag? please, because yeah. we can. So, uh, with the uh, uh, ball of the foot, uh, the heel in hand, uh, from extension after surgery with the knee not closed, we just start bending the knee up to the full range of motion without putting our hand elsewhere, just with one force. At certain point, if the knee feels like giving way, like a mild slight subluxation at some point of time during the range of motion that is the time i realized there is definitely some kind of mid flexion issue there most of the times the knees go through the range of motion with full pressure very easily they go range of motion completely and then i know oh, that's probably this probably correct so that's what other yeah. was saying exactly yeah, yes. shift, yeah. So you're trying to do a pivot shift i think there are different ways of doing it but basically what you're trying to do is something like a pivot shift but uh, Parag, can I make a point on uh, Sachin's presentation the last slide? Sure, sure. The um, conclusion, uh, Sachin, uh, you know, of course, uh, absolutely right. But uh, when you go to a hinge, of course, you don't want to use a hinge uh, unnecessarily. 
but for especially beginner surgeons who are going into revision surgery this advice of use as little constraint as possible is not a valid one because you know the instability in a revision is complex difficult to make out so the advice especially for junior surgeons would be uh, use a cck tc3 uh, and don't use ps unless you are a very experienced uh, um, revision surgeon would that be fair sir yeah i yeah. think so that is what i said that you should not overkill with uh, restraint use the correct amount of restraint and maximum number of your complex primary and revisions you can get away by doing a vvc or uh, that is a varus valgus constraint either lcck tc3 or whatever system you have in your uh, no 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 sachin what the point i'm saying is uh, a lot of us use ps in a revision scenario yeah so you can do a ps if you are comfortable but the general advice is uh, for the beginners not to do that i think yeah, yeah. so those those points <laughs> are will be Uh, yeah, Vijay, those points will be well covered by Dr. Ashok Rajgopal uh, in his yeah. cases. I have seen some of them, so oh, that should be good. So, so uh, over to Dr. Ashok Rajgopal for his case presentation. This is his first case, so over to uh, you, sir. Right. Thank, uh, thanks, Parag. That was an excellent presentation, Sachin. I think the preamble was absolutely perfect with some of the questions leading up to this. presentation so depending on how much time we have i what so i thought we have about 45 is, minutes to an hour starting now okay so uh, we have four primaries and three revisions um so let's just try and quickly cover so this is a patient who is a 69 year old female she is hypertensive hypothyroid she had a primary tkr to the cruciate retaining uh, type of uh, uh, procedure done in 2007 she has um, she did really very well she had no real complaints until about uh, a year ago uh, when i first saw her and at that point in time she had a, a feeling of giving way uh, she was mildly unstable uh, a low demand patient uh, rather obese uh, so we counseled her for uh, you know being kept under follow up and if we can uh, get the next uh, slide up for all yeah so if you can uh, maybe somebody from the from the panel can just comment quickly on the uh, uh, on the uh, on these x rays uh, so maybe vikas do you want to take that yes sir uh, this looks like uh, lateral laxity to me uh, on x rays and uh, probably post fall um yeah yeah, but, yeah so the on valgus strain as you said that it's less than 10 mm medial opening more than but on the x ray pri primarily it looks like lateral side is opening up so patient has probably torn the lateral collateral or posterior corner or something um anything else that you want to comment anybody wants to comment on these uh, on yeah. on the x ray posterior sag absolutely right yeah Very so this was a crucial between this was a cr knee done 2007 the <clears throat> uh, patient was absolutely asymptomatic i'm told um, i i did not do this primary uh, surgery um, but uh, their family friends have been seeing them for many many years uh, and absolutely right you see a posterior sag sign uh, she is unstable and there's a Uh, about 10 mm of posterior translation so for any comments uh, uh, let's start with you sachin since you made such a wonderful presentation on uh, on constraint how, how would you tackle this what would you what would be your first choice of uh, very quickly 1 2 3 what would you like to do so what we are trying to tackle here is posterior instability as well as lateral opening the lateral opening is not gross and i think conversion of this particular prosthesis from a cr to a ps probably would do the trick i would have an lcck as a backup but my primary plan will be to convert it to a straight forward ps knee excellent any any other any other diversions any other contra opinions uh, i would i would certainly uh, i would go for a tc3 so uh, you know uh, i wouldn't do a ps on this chronic situations yeah so in chronic situations uh, there is a uh, there's probably she ruptured her uh, you know cruciate and that's what caused it but not, but in a chronic situation you have secondary laxity you have other structures that become lax so i would go to a tc3 straight off 
Okay, Any, uh, anyone else? Anyone would like to consider a hinge or any such thing? I don't think so. A hinge no, would be no. necessary because yeah, once we go true. in, you know, yeah. at the most uh, LCCK as a backup should be good enough. But yeah. uh, as I agree with Sachin's plan as the first line of treatment, but on table, if you're having some yeah. surprises, it's good to have a, a backup. Right. Of, uh, Absolutely. LCCK. So, um, so th these were the questions that were in our mind. We have wanted to check out the interoperability. Uh, EUA, ex uh, our exposure was a standard. We have never diverged from a antromedial at worst or best. We do a rectus snip and varying degrees of rectus snip. And uh, these were the things that, are, that were in our mind as to what we needed to do for this. Um, so, uh, and so we did exactly what you mentioned, Sachin. Um, she ended up with a PS. We increased the height. We changed from a CR to a PS. The tibia was really very, very well fixed. Um, we used a 17 millimeter polyethylene. Uh, got excellent stability. This lady is now two years out um, doing everything that she wants to. Um, one of the things that I, uh, I want to sort of mention on this lateral view is when you're doing this uh, unconstrained revisions, uh, one of the key uh, components of the revision procedure is to pick out the right size of your femoral component because that also takes care of your flexion gap. So you basically upsize your, uh, uh, your femoral component. The second point that I like to make here is if you notice, we have been able to adequately restore the posterior contour offset. Uh, for me, uh, the posterior contour offset is a critical issue, both in terms of uh, um, giving a patient an acceptable knee, a forgotten joint score has a great merit in restoring the posterior contour offset, and this also gives a very good range of flexion. So this lady is two years out, has about 120 degrees of stable flexion, is able to climb up and down stairs. As I said, she's not a particularly active person, but she does, is able to do everything that she needs to uh, and is really quite happy with her outcome. I saw her about uh, six weeks ago, just before this COVID uh, stuff happened, and she's really very, very happy with her, um, with her outcome. All right, so... May I ask one question? Yes. Yeah, sure. So what are the tips and tricks in primary as well as revision to restore the posterior condylar offset? Uh, okay, so, so, that, so that's a great question. Um, now, you know, the, the issue really is uh, in a way somewhat historical because some of the earlier designs, we had limited sizes of the femoral components. So where, when you were between, a, uh, between two sizes and you were a CR surgeon, you tended basically to upsize the femur. And if you were a PS surgeon, you tended to downsize the femur because of the cam and post. With the advent of the uh, of your newer implants, uh, you know, and there are various uh, options in the market. The two things that I would like to sort of mention is when you are sizing your femoral component, size it to the lateral most uh, aspect of the ridge on the anterolateral surface of the femur. By doing that, you get a slightly upsized femur and you will be able to adequately uh, um, get the right size. And that will give you the, the, uh, the, uh, the appropriate uh, posterior contour offset because posterior contour offset also has a bearing on what we call the dwell point, which is really the point that dictates the fulcrum on the medial side of the medial articular surface around which that has an excursion of between one to three millimeters. And it's around this that if you have a snug uh, compact medial ball, as it were, if you look at the little wheel, wheel concept, you'll be able to reconstruct the, um, the posterior contour offset. Okay. Uh, you reverse the, uh, the CR with the PS, uh, Without using revision components, is it? Is that correct? Uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, okay. you, took, you took the CR off and. Uh, I changed yeah. only the femoral component. Of the, I, I retained the tibia. Tibia is very, very well fixed. And we changed the femoral component from a CR one size up to a PS. Uh, got an excellent stability. We went from a 14 to a 17. 
uh, articular surface and the patient is really done quite well. Okay. So how do you how do you upsize without uh, posterior augments? Sorry? So how do you upsize the thema without posterior augments? You don't, you, you, you just use a next size up. Only. One size bigger, one size bigger femur. You don't need to use an augment. I mean, you can obviously use an augment. The problem with an augment really is uh, a, in this particular case, it is not needed. And my own bias really is I would use augments really with a stemmed femoral implant because the torque on the interface between your augment and the bone is really quite considerable. So if I'm not using a stem augment on the femoral side, I would tend to use a upsize, one size up femur rather than using posterior augments. They do quite okay. well. So there is one, uh, one uh, point which I wanted to ask you. Don't you think 14 mm of a primary CR insert poly was an indication which you would have got intro of that this was probably going to fail in 10 years anyway? with uh, such a thick insert in CR, which is really um, done by us. Because as I said, this is not one of my primaries. This was done, actually, believe it or not, this, this was done overseas. And from, uh, from uh, in 10 years, this patient was absolutely delighted with her results. She had absolutely no complaints. She, um, in, uh, interestingly enough, comes from your part of the world. She is not <laughs> And she's been attending all the Durga Puja and uh, doing all uh, all those dances and stuff. So she's really been really quite happy with her outcome. And at the end of the day, I mean, we can talk about uh, the height and so on. Uh, and I take your point. I mean, today we are more um, aware of the fact that you want to use the minimal size of insert. But uh, I think there is a, there is sufficient data now in literature to say that 12 to 14 millimeters polys actually do quite well. Okay, so I used to think that PCL would get more compromised with larger poly. We tend to cut more. I, th I think the reason people used larger polys was because they had resected more bone. There was a lack yes. of understanding. And uh, if you also notice the other point in this uh, very subtle, if you look at the tibial cut, it is in varus. And when I, when I actually spoke to the patient in her operative notes meticulously kept by uh, this lovely Bengali lady, uh, the surgeon had attempted some sort of a kinematic alignment in this uh, in this knee. So that that would explain that. Okay. okay. So Sachin, you had a quick comment? Yeah, no, I have a question. I think uh, okay. on the same uh, point which uh, Mukesh had asked is that how do you restore posterior corneal offset? So my question to the panel is that uh, in a primary situation, what would help you achieve a better restoration of the posterior corneal offset and anterior referencing or a posterior referencing? Okay, let me answer that. Uh, this is a question very, very close to my heart, uh, Sachin. Um, I very, very strongly believe, and it's almost a religion with me, that I would always only do an anterior referencing system. I would not do a posterior referencing system. Okay. Yes. What would be the reason for that? What would be the thought process behind that particular so, referencing? So, Do you feel the, that it restores the posterior corner offset better? Um, it it does, and for me, the most important uh, aspect of uh, the of posterior referencing system is certainly in our part of the world where you have severe deformities with varus and valgus. If you have a severe varus deformity and there is a tibial bone loss on the medial uh, tibial condyle, there is a compensatory overgrowth of the medial femoral condyle. So if you use muscular instrumentation, you will turn that femoral component of yours into internal rotation, and you will yes. exactly it with that in a valgus knee which has yeah, a really? defect that is adapting to the defect in the lateral tibial condyle. So you would externally ro rotate your femoral component in a valgus knee and internally rotate it in a femoral, in a varus knee. Yes. Okay. Answering uh, Sachin's question, I think uh, posterior referencing would uh, restore offset better. That is what yeah. I thought, yeah. Yeah. So I think uh, the, uh, there's been good discussion on this case. Should we go to the next case or any quick uh, concluding remarks for case one? So I... Um, the only point I'd like to make here is that you need to do uh, horses for courses. 
uh, see what the patient needs. We don't necessarily need to, to revise both components. In fact, there is a very elegant paper that uh, came out in 2010, Journal of Arthroplasty. Uh, single component revisions in the appropriate situations do just as well as full component, and there are set very clear indications for both. Okay, okay. So let's go to the, uh, the second case, which is on the valgus knee. Right, so this is a patient who is a 76-year-old diabetic, obese female patient. Um, so as you can see that there is a fairly severe valgus deformity in this lady. Um, very quick, uh, maybe, uh, Sharon, do you, uh, you seeing that it's your birthday, we'd like to give you a nice birthday present. <laughs> Uh, uh, no, no the, this uh, the, uh, first thing is to us, look at the, walk, us, walk us through your thought process with this yeah. knee. But first, for, for, yeah, first thing is I would like to see if it is a correctable deformity, a stress view this might help me fixed, in that. This, this is a fixed valgus deformity. Right. She is 76 yeah. and she yeah. has a fixed deformity. Her hips are yeah. fine, her spine is fine, her contralateral knee is all right. This is an isolated exactly. unilateral valgus fixed yeah. component. Yeah. yeah. So it's obviously a situation where we might need extensive lateral release. I would still go by the anteromedial approach, do as much of releases as possible. If I find that I have to release beyond a point where there is lateral instability, I would go in for a semi-constrained knee and that should be able to align and give me stability as well. So can you, for, for, the, for the panel and for the people listening in, describe your lateral release. When you say extensive lateral release, what does that entail? What do you do? What do you release? Inside okay. out, outside in, yeah. by crusting, uh, yeah. lateral yeah. osteotomy, what do you do? Yeah, uh, I am not very fond of doing the lateral epicondyl or osteotomy. I have not done many. And I would just stretch it out, use a laminar spreader and keep releasing. And you go to the iliotibial band and uh, all the structures which are tight. And at the end of it, the last one I would like to do. Uh, sorry. Uh, the last one would be the pipe resting of the lateral collateral ligament. So with that, I would check my stability on the lateral side. If I'm not happy, as I said, I would go through for a TC3-like situation. Right. Any one of the panel um, want to describe anything different that they do? Well, my, uh, it will be I, inside out for me. I, I would do the same. If the bank is in extension, I would release the IT band completely. But if uh, the, uh, the valgus deformity is still present and I still haven't corrected the FFD, then I will do an epicolor osteotomy. But I have only an isolated valgus, I will do a pie crusting. Right. So, yeah, there, there are very many different ways to, to address this problem. Um, some years back, we actually uh, described our uh, technique uh, in uh, the Journal of Arthroplasty and the Journal of Orthopedic Surgery. And more recently, in 2019, we published our experience in the seminars in arthroplasty, and I presented this at the CCGR. A um, couple of really sort of interesting points which we learned along the way, I want to share this with you. Um, the, the biggest challenge with valgus knees that we, we have found in all the years that we've been doing these knees is to understand at what point of time your lateral release is adequate and sufficient. Uh, because one of the challenges that happens is when you over-release it, you get into the situation of a postal lateral instability. That's almost an impossible instability to correct with any kind of conventional implants, and you almost inevitably have to fall in line with the constrained type of an option. So uh, by hit and trial, we actually came out with this, and we um, published this and described this. Uh, if you take your knee in extension after you've done your releases and you're able to rotate your tibial tubercle past the sagittal plane, that means you can internally rotate it beyond the center of the cochlear groove, that is an adequate step in release. When we start doing your releases, you keep releasing it and keep doing this in extension. Once you're able to do that in extension, you flex this to about 75 degrees of flexion and do the same thing. And then you try that at 90. 
So if you are able to internally rotate the tibia at 75, 90 and full extension, just short of full extension, that, that is indicative of the fact that you've done an adequate lateral or a posterolateral release. And at that point of time, you can do your cuts and you can decide on whatever form of uh, constraint or uh, choice of implant option that you may need to use. Uh, so this is just a, just an anecdotal thing that we, we have found extremely useful. We use this in every single fixed valgus knee and it has stood us in good stead. And uh, we've been extremely sort of gratified by this, um, by this experience. Um, so we can go to the next um, uh, slide, Parag, where we, we can just see what, uh, in this patient, the, one of the challenges was we had a incompetent um, MCL. And in spite of our, uh, in spite of our valgus uh, re release, we released pretty much everything, including the postulatal corner, the pie crusted, the iliotibial band. We actually had to also take down the uh, popliteus tendon here. Um, and we treated this using a LCC cape or a TC3, uh, you know, one of those constraint type of an options. And uh, this patient uh, did quite well. Any comments? Parag, can you show us the post-op? Yeah, Jacob, you want to make any comments? This is the post-op x-ray. Uh, Jacob? My only issue is that I'll definitely want to feel the middle side endpoint before I start to know whether I need to do anything more. So more than how much I corrected, I want to see what the endpoint is. I always release the IT band from the tibia. Every case when this valve is an extension. So I don't know, I know a lot of people don't do it. I release it from the tibial, from the Gurdy's tubercle. And then, of course, do the femoral rotation, try not to internal rotate. Do my trials before I do my postlateral pie crusting. So that's the way I would go for it. But I need to get an endpoint pre op or when I start from the meter side before I start. Okay. Anybody else before we go to the next yeah. case? Okay. So let's go to the case three. This is on the extra articular deformity. <laughs> Uh, right, so th this is a very interesting uh, case. 74-year-old uh, gentleman, diabetic, hypertensive, almost uh, 17, 18 years back, he had a road traffic accident and had a bilateral lower end femur fracture that was treated conservatively. Um, so this is his uh, preoperative uh, x-ray. is now in severe pain and... Uh, Any anyone like to take? Uh, let's talk about both uh, the right and uh, one to your left is the left. Uh, one to your right is the left knee. The one to your left is the right knee. Um, so. Right as your. Uh, like to take. First of all, would you use conventional instruments? Would you use navigation? Would you use robotics? Would you use eyeballing? What would you do? Navigation. Okay. Anyone else? I want to get a limb alignment and X-ray to see what's happening. A long, long alignment film. Okay. Uh, all right. Can we go to the next? Uh, it also gives. The post-operative X-ray, but your your answer. We can go to the next uh, next slide, uh, Parag, please. Okay. Yes. So, so this is. Uh, does that answer anything? So, the point that I'm uh, trying to make over here is: mm -hmm. so, what defines uh, your cuts in these knees? Uh, who would like to take that question? How do you decide on your femoral valgus? Uh, how do you make your femoral osteotomy, your distal cut? Uh, tibia is really un, uh, it's untouched. But on the femoral side, somebody can walk me through uh, the right side and then maybe on the left side. Vijay, do you want to take that? The principles doesn't change. 
you want your cut to be distal cut to be uh, perpendicular to the mechanical axis the hip knee ankle axis whether it is valgus or varus it's all the same so i um, i would put about 4 uh, degree for valgus and 5 degree for varus uh, using navigation okay you would navigate this uh, any any uh, any thoughts in your mind on when you would do a correction of this extra articular deformity do you have any thresholds uh, in this case would you have done anything differently uh not really so the long axis of the or anatomical axis is uh, if you extend the anatomical axis and comes within the joint uh, it's quite okay for intraocular correction so right. i'd be happy to do an intraocular correction in this particular case right so yeah that's absolutely correct i mean you can you can do this with navigation robotic so you can do it eyeballing your your way through a uh, couple couple of points there's an excellent uh, article by wang um, and he's <clears throat> pretty much talked about the same thing that vijay spoke about if you cut <clears throat> at the mechanical axis and if that cuts within the collateral ligament attachment you don't you can correct that as an intraarticular procedure and if it cuts beyond the attachment of the collateral then you need to correct the extra articular deformity in the closer the deformity is to the joint <clears throat> the uh, greater the chances that you may need to do a correction uh, can we go to the next slide for uh, i just want to it's an interesting yeah yeah this is the one if you can just go yeah yes this... um so the point here that i would like to make is uh, if you look at the the right uh, the left side x ray it actually looks really very very well aligned and if you go to the previous uh, uh, parag please and this has been taken in neutral rotation so when you have extra articular deformities always make sure that you get your knees in your radiology or radiographer takes the x rays in neutral alignment because if you see the previous x rays it actually gives the feeling that it is under corrected and the limb is still in bears the actual reason for that was the fact that this patient had a uh, was x rayed in external rotation and it gives a bit of a dilemma as to whether the adequate correction has been achieved so in this patient we actually managed to get a reasonably good correction um again fairly elderly person limited expectations and uh, has uh, has done quite quite well right um so yeah, can we move any any things. comments from any, yeah, any questions uh, we haven't had a uh, in a post traumatic situation uh, the lateral x ray would be helpful and sometimes i do ct scans to see the anatomy of the disc femur is all right yeah. or not yeah that's I, one thing which will be of that. some help Yeah, so I take your point. The only we did not put that up because it was pretty uneventful. Uh, there was no right. the the, uh, the anchoration was in the plane of the antro antrolateral curvature, so which is the reason why I did not put this up. Uh, and, and just just the is, other thing is for yeah, and to take the judgment call on if we are not using navigation or robotics any of that and doing conventionally to get the rotation of the femoral side right, I would use the tibial. cut surface uh, as a renawat block technique to get the rotational alignment right of the femoral side because the trans epicondylar axis here could be here where right yeah yeah that's a, that that's a great that churn uh, ashok i presume you didn't use navigation you use navigation for this no did you use navigation i never use navigation uh, yeah so you put no, no, no. it in the rod in the femur how do you get it right so so it is easy to uh, you drill a hole and if it is a various deformity you take it laterally and under image intensified you can actually put a canal reamer right up the uh, medullary canal and then you just proceed and do it the conventional way that's what we do yeah yeah okay right so Last can we one? move to uh, should we do we have how are we doing for time for us are we doing uh, well we are all right we have about 30 minutes less than about 20 minutes to 25 minutes more okay, may I ask so one in this case yes let's uh, last question on this case yes go ahead the because of distorted distal femur anatomy how 
to get the exact sizing of the femur with available size jigs um so again a, a great question um fortunately most of these extra articular deformities are juxta articular which really means that the surface of your articular geometry is usually unchanged so you do not need to change or diverge too much from your conventional measuring techniques so whatever system you follow you use your sizer in that plane and um go exactly the way that i would do for a non extra articular deformed arthritic technique okay okay so let's go to the next case uh, uh, which is uh, a very severe deformity yes so i'm sure this is bread and butter to everybody on the panel each one of us has <laughs> uh address this scene this uh, as you might imagine this lady is uh, is rheumatoid neglected many many intraarticular steroid injections uh has been on demards and so on and so forth has been on a uh, walker ambulation very very limited ambulation for this patient uh so very quickly uh, in the next 5 minutes uh, jacob you want to take this uh, give us your thoughts around this i think i might just all what i need probably is a wedge and i'll definitely keep a constraint liner uh, a constraint virus valgus constraint implants on the table but i think the mcl will be intact most likely in this i probably need to build up the tibia because if you take the lateral view i can see the deepest part of the femur is still above the fibula so if at all i might need a wedge on the medial side and then the, the either main question is about uh, the mcl here jacob so i think yeah. i think mcl will be intact most likely here but i'll okay. definitely keep a uh, i'll definitely keep a, a what do you call it a, a varus valgus constant implant there i don't think i'll need a rotating hinge i think the mcl will be intact so the okay. superior mcl is slightly more deeper than this okay so um so this was actually a patient that um, we operated about 3 years ago uh, and she had massive global instability you can put you could pretty much swing that tibia anywhere you wanted uh the mcl <clears throat> was in fact incompetent as was the posterior lateral corner <clears throat> and uh, she had massive bone loss on the on the tibial side um we tried what you just suggested jacob which was we tried our luck with the lcck type of design but we're still unhappy about the kind of stability where that we were able to achieve on the table so this was one of those cases where i actually went in with a hinge uh para can we go for the next uh, next slide the post op yes it's on the screen it is right so Uh, have you yeah. got it so uh, we we used a bone graft to uh, build up the medial medial condyle of the tibia we did not use a stem on the on the tibial side but we used a lcc uh, we used a rotating hinge uh, got a very very good construct good stable construct um this patient has obviously being a severe rheumatoid she has other joints involved is basically a walker ambulator walks within the house has a walking um, target of roughly about 150 200 meters more or less homebound walks in the veranda outside the house uh, but this is just an example of uh, having to use a very very high level of constraint um, given the steroid injection there was possibly some element of a neuropathic joint as well here so possibly you know we walked through that option did not want to have a late failure and uh, consequently we went, ended up with a uh, with a uh, rhk over here um in fact interestingly enough uh, sachin's uh, uh, talk uh, we we have three publications on rhk and we have recently published a uh, 15 year uh, rhk data in the acta orthopedica and we have a survival figure of 86% at 15 years so it is really a robust um, uh, treatment option and it really stands the test of time 
Right. Any any other comments from the any of the panelists? Any so the bone graft? What you have done? The, what kind of a, a graft have you used to build up the medial bone defect? And so uh, this was part of the uh, fem femoral condyle that we we pulled out the posterior condyle of the femur. We turned it around, fre uh, fashion uh, freshened the edges, and we used uh, two screws: one going anteriorly and one posteriorly. Uh, cancellous screws with washers right? and uh, uh, put um, morselized graft between the surfaces. And uh, I, uh, th this lady is about six months, I think, six or eight months post-op. She's okay. doing well. I guess. She's a limited ambulator, but is really okay. steady and uh, is able to do all the stuff that she wants. Okay. Okay. So uh, yes, I have a question, Please. Dr. Raj Gopal. Is that uh, you know your choice of stem in these uh, individuals who are grossly osteoporotic? Would you prefer to use fully cemented stems, uh, stem extensions, or would you prefer to use hybrid stem extensions? So, uh, if I'm using a long stem surgeon, I never ever do a fully cemented. I use a uh, the, the proximal third is cemented. The rest of it is basically almost like a press fit. More recently, in the last 12 to 14 months, I have gone off long stems almost exclusively. Uh, unless we are using a very big wedge or a large graft, we use short stubby stems, fully cement them. We use bone plugs at the end we, and uh, we fully cement a stem which is about 40 millimeters. And again, we look at recent literature data in general of arthroplasty and general of knee surgery, there is excellent uh, long-term survivorship of short stems in comparison to long stems. So um, mechanically, biomechanically, a short stubby stem fully cemented uh, does very, very well. And today I think almost all of my stems are short stubby, fully cemented um, with a bone plug on both sides. So what about the femoral side? This particular one, the femur is a hybrid cementation, is it? Yes, it's a hybrid cementation. We have we use cement in the uh, proximal, uh, almost about half, and it is uncemented beyond that. So your data on RHK is uh, hybrid cementation. Can we take it like that, your 15-year data? Yes, it is, yes, because this is my earlier work, and um, it, it is a hybrid cementation with 86% survivorship at 15 years. Yeah, thanks, yeah. And it's the same implant, the same same implant, same company implant. You didn't... It's the same company implant, but the RHK has been modified in 2010, 2009, 2010. 2007 was a slightly earlier iteration of this implant. Um, in fact, interestingly enough, 14% um, of my failures that we reported out of that, almost 70% were the first iteration RHKs. Um, where the uh, locking pin and locking mechanism was uh, not as robust. So we had femoral loosening and in two patients, we had pull out of the uh, cross screws uh, that went into the tibial component. Uh, but ever since we've changed the, to the recent the RHK, the rotating platform, our incidence of failures is actually only about 3%. May I ask one more thing, Ashok? Yeah, sorry, go on. Yeah. Considering the chronicity of the symptoms and the quality of bone, would tibial sleeve or cone would have been a better option over the bone graft in this case? Um, so sleeve and cone is usually used for a cavitatory defect. This is a peripheral defect. If you can see, we have reasonably good cortex uh, below. So, and this was really like an angular wedge. We could have used a wedge. Uh, somehow, I'm not a great believer in metal augments, uh, and I think all over the world, people are actually going off metal augments and going on more towards biological or trabecular metal uh, options. I reserve my trabecular metal uh, devices for cavitatory central defects or where there is bone loss. And uh, we, we uh, again, are great sort of lovers of the trabecular metal cones. Uh, we have described, in fact, uh, a stacked uh, bone for periprosthetic fractures, and I'll show that in one of my revision uh, patient, patients as we just go along. So uh, we use that typically, even in primary situations, only for central defects. All right. 
Ashok, when you're talking about the, the cemented stems uh, with bone plugs, we are doing it almost like uh, the like the hips, where you use a cement exactly. gun and nicely put it in and uh, do it like Absolutely. a hip. Yeah. yeah, right, right. Because that's exactly yeah. what I do as well. So yeah. Yeah. Can I just ask a question quickly? Yeah. It's regarding the, you know, the other RSK, the link RSK, which works very differently, where you have a metal going into the femur. Have you, have you people used that? The, the link? Oh, yeah, we have yeah, used it, but we usually so don't call it RSK. The RSK, usually we call it uh, uh, Zimma, but the link we are used a lot, yeah. So, you know, what do you think about, the, it's a very similar, very different way of uh, uh, linking it. <laughs> What, what is your comments regarding that? Um, it is not a, you know, the, both the RHK as well as the link, the hinge mechanism sits in the central, the, uh, the you know, the post region. That's where it sits. In contrast to all other hinges, where it is the condyle which takes the hinge. So in a lot of ways, both are similar, I would think, the RHK and the link. The, the peg is metal inside poly, the reverse of what... These yeah, are. That is that. That's true. That's very but different. In many ways, uh, we find compared to, for example, the uh, depu hinge or any other hinge, this is uh, these two are similar because they take less bone and they and the hinge mechanism in the, is in the intercondylar region. The only challenge, which as we know, it's in the hyperextension situation, they don't work very well. Yeah, more true of the link hinges. Yeah, yeah, correct. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Right. So uh, we can move on to the, the revision situation. This is a 81-year-old lady uh, infected six years after TKR. Um, she had um, a two-stage procedure, two-stage. Uh, uh, can we go to the next slide? Uh, can somebody quickly walk me through their protocols or algorithm for uh, of revision? What do you do? Uh, very briefly, if you can cover that, somebody. I think, sir, this case is shown some different, and you're talking of different case. Yeah, yeah, it looks different, yes. Parak, sir, I think case number five. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's the one. That's the one. Yes. Yeah, no, no this, this is the same. You can, uh, this is the this yeah, this is a lady who had a preoperative. Yeah, so this patient had, uh, she, she had infection. She had a two stage. Uh, we did the, the first stage. Um, this is the, her preoperative status at the time when she came to us with infection. So just walk me through. The, uh, their protocols. Uh, if there are any discharging sinuses, send the cultures and all that and uh, see if we can find the organism before. Uh, I generally so, prefer to do two stage, even so, though uh, okay. so, culture will, will give some indication. Yeah. Sorry, Ashok. So in the interest of time, this lady was, uh, she was aspirated. She went through cultures, CRP, set rates and so on. Um, her, she had, she grew uh, Staph aureus, uh, yeah. she had a stage one, and uh, uh, how long would you wait after stage one and what would your indications be for proceeding to stage two? So we knew the sensitivities, uh, we put her on parental antibiotics, so... And an antibiotic loaded spacer, I suppose, so... Please go ahead. Yeah, and an antibiotic loaded spacer. And generally yeah, yeah, the waiting yeah. so time she... is anywhere between four to six weeks for me. Um, if the sed rates and the CRP comes down and the sinuses all heal up and uh, she's nutritionally looking better, uh, then I'll give a, a week of antibiotic free time to see if it is uh, if the CSR, CSR and CRPs don't go up. And if that's the case, I would go in. And especially if it is a known organism, I would be more confident to go in and do a second stage anywhere between four to six weeks. Yeah, we will do the same. Uh, uh, we will not, we will not re-aspirate. So if the uh, CRP has to be normal, the ESR must show a downward trend. It may not be normal yet. Clinically normal. Clinically, it looks everything looks quiet. 
uh, in two weeks of antibiotics, of antibiotics, if the uh, CRP and the ESR stays the same or comes down, we're happy to proceed. If it goes up, then we'll have to reevaluate options. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Just a very, I think that's pretty standard, uh, Vijay. That's exactly what uh, is recommended by all the anyone on the panel who subscribes to the one stage uh, revision, anyone on the panel who believes that one stage is the way to go. A lot of talk about it, a lot more and more people are turning in that direction. Um, you have people like Ferris Haddad, um, the uh, endocrinic guys, Thorst Garke. Uh, I think if you've got a good bug, you've got a good micro uh, team, and we both share the one. Yeah, so, uh, so static spacer or um, uh, dynamic spacer? We, we I'm all happy with the static spacer. Static spacer. spacer. You all, so everybody Hard uses static spacer. spacer? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, static. Um, does anybody in the panel? Does anyone on the panel remove the implant, autoclave it, and use it as a spacer? No. Sachin? Would... No, I won't. But no. I would definitely do an articulating spacer. I will not re-sterilize the implants for sure. So my preference would be to use an articular okay. spacer right. unless there is compromised soft tissue envelope, which will then make me use a static spacer. Right. OK. And any, any, any comments about how many weeks of post-operatives after second stage would you keep these patients on antibiotics for any length of time or do you just give, it, give them three doses and then done with it, three weeks, three months, six months, one year? Uh, uh, what, what, is the, what is the evidence? What... Uh, well, we send recultures at the time of second stage uh, just to make sure that we are not uh, missing any pockets of infection. But normally our protocol is three weeks of IV and another three weeks of oral antibiotics in most cases. Most okay, Sharon, let me, let, let me ask you an awkward question. Now you've done your second yeah. stage, you've taken your cultures and the culture turns out to be yes, positive. Yes. What would you do then? No, then it, it will be a little more aggressive with our IV antibiotic therapy and hoping to keep it suppressed for longer length of time. All right. Okay. All right. I, I wouldn't be very worried about that. Uh, so if the, we do get the positive cultures uh, sometimes, but there's no biofilm there because we removed everything. We had done a deployment second stage as well. So we'll, uh, we'll take it like a one stage revision. So we're not overtly worried about that, but we'll make sure we give more uh, long term antibiotics. Even if it is not positive, we'll give a minimum three months. Now the trend is to give uh, more longer antibiotics. When we have positive, we probably give uh, four to six months of antibiotics. Right. I, okay. So I, I think I've opened up a Pandora's box over there. A uh, <laughs> lot of uh, options in opinion. All right, Prak, can you go to the next uh, one where you can see? Yeah. So this is what we did uh, for the question on the sleeve. We, as you can see here, we used a rotating hinge here. Uh, the only reason we, we used a rotating hinge here was um, the, the medial collateral ligament was completely chewed up. And um, um, this patient, I did not show you the intervening um, spacer um, um, x-rays uh, in the interest of time. But what actually happened with this patient, again, this was one which we had inherited. Uh, the spacer had dislocated and this patient had been told to walk on it. Uh, there was attrition rupture of the medial collateral ligament. And so she was a very unstable infected knee. Uh, so we had to do a second debridement and we had considerable bone loss and uh, hence the need for the TM cone. We used a, a central TM cone with a constrained rotating hinge type of an option. Right. Um, shall, we, shall we move on? Any, any, other, any, any other comments? or? Uh, so I uh, think uh, I'd like to ask a question. I mean... So one of the important things is, uh, and there's a question that's coming up on my uh, phone as well. So there's a question saying that, what are the tips or technical tips from the panel for ensuring that you've restored the joint line correctly when we're doing a revision where you have obscured landmarks? Okay, so is that for me, Sachin, or? No, it's, it's, it's to the panel. I think you start off by answering it. And if uh, the other 
panelists have some extra tips or tricks right. that they can definitely share it there. Okay, so uh, th there are three three anatomical landmarks, uh, Sachin. The first is the medial epicondyle. It is rare to have destruction of both the epicondyles. So usually one or both of the epicondyles will usually remain intact. So that's your index. You want to place your joint line about 2.5 to 2.6 centimeters distal to the trans epicondyl line. The second landmark is the position of your patella. Um, in relation to your femoral component, you want to seat that in the middle of the trochlear groove. The third indicator of your joint line level is the head of the fibula. And that is almost always intact. So about um, 1.5 centimeters proximal to the tip of the head of the fibula, uh, 2.5 to 2.6 centimeters distal to the transepicondylar axis, and with your petala seated in the trochlear notch of your femoral component. Those are the three things that I would look at. Perfect, perfect. You can, you can also look? do a, a mid flexion inseminate test, like in uh, this thing. If you're not using a hinge, of course, yeah. If you're not using a hinge, then you can look for uh, uh, in the middle range. And that again will tell you that you have elevated the joint line. Okay, fine. Right. Okay, so let's go to the next uh, the next patient. This is a a um, seventy one year old patient, left TKR two thousand ten. He had, he had uh, no comorbidity. Uh, he had a history of fall uh, a year ago. This was referred to me um, about I think six or eight months ago. And uh, can we see, see the post-op, uh, the pre-op x-rays? Right, so this was the, uh, this was the patient. Um, and uh, he, he, he was obviously in pain, but uh, was told to continue with his, uh, with his ambulation, which, and believe it or not, he walked on this with a walker for about two, three weeks before the pain became excruciating. Uh, and so, uh, who, Parag, may, maybe uh, you yeah. can take this case and tell me. Yeah, so the, the first thing what uh, I would do in this case is to rule out infection. So do all the studies for infection, aspiration, and uh, ESR, CRP. Uh, assuming there is no infection, then uh, the, because it's one year since the patient had the fracture and you said walking for one year. So was there an infection? Did you... Yes, so we did the entire um, algorithm for the infection. We did the, all, all of that. Uh, right. we, in fact, we even did the cyanobasure for this patient. That was negative. His cultures were negative. His uh, serum and his synovial fluid CRP was, was clear. Right. Uh, so excluded everything from... Uh, so if the infection is ruled out, then for me, then this would uh, uh, be a case where, you know, you can already see a lot of bone loss. Uh, I would think of a hinged prosthesis for this case and uh, uh, think of various options to build up the bone loss so I don't end up with shortening. I particularly like uh, the uh, link hinge processes and right. I've been using the link uh, hinge process for a while and you can get those augments which we can put and then build up the height. It's relatively easier to an RHK. I've used an RHK also, but I find it easier. And uh, okay. my particular choice in this will be a hinge processes and uh, uh, link kind of a hinge processes. Sure, great, great. Any any other comments from any of the other panelists? Uh, looking at me, uh, the extensive. Sorry, sorry, go on. Yeah. Go on, go on. Go on. Yeah. No, uh, the, for the best, the best part of this is the extensor mechanism seems to be intact with the tibial tubercle area seems to be okay. Uh, I would definitely keep the hinge as a backup. I won't jump to that straight away. Maybe the MCL on the tibial tibial side um, may be suspect. I would go and remove everything. And here the joint line has to be built up nicely. And I definitely will need uh, augments. And I, I would definitely look at a sleeve. Metaphysical sleeve is something which I'm very familiar with. Mm -hmm. I'd look at that on the tibial side. 
uh, and uh, see if I can build it up and bring the joint line to normalcy, provided the MCL is intact and I'm able to get that ligaments in place. If it is well, not, then straight away well, go for the MCL. Yes, yeah, so I was assuming well, that the MCL would not be there, especially on the tibial side, you know, the MCL is not it's there. Possible. Here, uh, it's point. It looks, uh, uh, can I come in please? Yes, it yes, looks, it's it looks, uh, it looks uh, pretty dicey because there is nothing on uh, yeah, the metaphysical uh, side, you know. It's uh, uh, almost like you would be doing a, a proximal tibial replacement in a case yeah. like this. I doubt I'm whether we so have, sure. I'm not so sure. I, I doubt whether you will have much because you are right away going to the end of metaphysical area once you take out the implant on the tibial Agreed. side. And not only that, if you look at the head of the fibula, and one centimeter above would be the joint. Yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, I, I think I would keep that also in hand. So I would keep a, suddenly a tumor process. Uh, yes, I would keep a tumor prosthesis in hand. All okay. right. Okay, so different opinions, all right, all correct. So I'll tell you what we did. Uh, can we go to the next slide? Yeah, so uh, this, uh, Parag, you're absolutely bang on. The tibial insertion of the MCL was compromised. Um, th there was a combination of fracture of the uh, lateral tibial plateau. Uh, so uh, effectively what we did was a rotating hint. This was completely sort of smashed up. It was very, very unstable. And one of the things that we, uh, we use a lot of is are these, when we do use long stems in difficult revisions, we do use a offset stem. And uh, I don't know how many in the panel use it, but we, we are great uh, lovers and advocates of the uh, stem. For one thing, you can actually posteriorize your femoral component using the same size. You don't necessarily need to upsize it by using the offset in the opposite direction. You can actually reduce the flexion space very, very effectively. Um, uh, in this case, of course, you know, because of the constraint of uh, everything having been lost, um, we used a rotating hinge um, and uh, uh, we have got a reasonably good construct. We have restored the patella back to the trochlear nodes, as you can see on the lateral view. And uh, this patient has really done quite well. May I ask one? Yes, so one or two questions before we go to the Sir, last case. You have built up the bone with cement. How long will it last? And uh, I was about to comment about that uh, fibular head, but already marked. Yeah, so... Um, See, I think at the end of the day, uh, your alignment of your joint line levels in these very difficult situations, if you're able to bring the petala back up to the trochlear groove, I think you've done reasonably well. Okay. Uh, these are difficult situations, not absolutely ideal. Um, so the answer to the question is, if, since we have restored our petala in, al in alignment with the trochlear notch, so Ashok, these days you do a cemented tibia, yeah, for this one? The uh, stem. So I, I was just coming to that, Vijay. Uh, uh, this would be one of the few indications where we have extensive bone loss. We also had, unfortunately, I hate to sort of admit this uh, on a public platform. Uh, it's really not the right thing to be saying. But in an ideal situation, I would have used a couple of uh, TM cones costs were a constraint, so we yes, did not yeah. have option. We, we use cement. And to answer your question on how long it will last, I think this knee, this knee will last for at least 15 years only because this is a fully cemented stem. And again, it is a press fit stem. Uh, we have got a good column of cement all the way distal, so I don't see this uh, subsiding. Can I just ask yeah. a question, Ashok? Yeah. Jacob. One, of, one of the issues I have this, uh, one or two companies is the housing for the stem in smaller femurs end up eating the anterior cortex for yep. a couple of companies. And so when I have a smaller femur, I, that's why I started slowly going towards link in some of these. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Is that a problem with, or you get it with some so, No, I think that's a great point, Jacob. I, I couldn't agree more with you. Uh, the old, so that is one of the reasons why I went off from the straight stems onto these offset stems. And by using offset stems, you can actually manipulate your fem femoral component and the stem housing to accommodate in the widest part of the uh, medullary canal. Okay. 
All right. Uh, if you, uh, sorry, just to make one point, uh, if if you didn't have the cost constraints with the metaphyseal sleeves, you are able to raise the joint line quite nicely and use it in situations like this. Even oh yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sharon, the only point okay, on the joint so... line, I, even if I had a constraint, if I had to use a TM cone, I would not yeah. change too much on this because, as I yeah, said, I'm repeatedly you know, saying, petrol is quite, yeah, yeah, I agree I would not like yes, to sir. sort of elevate it more and get a petal of bar. Yes, That's a yes, bad, yes. bad yeah. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so, so let's go to the last case. Uh, the, about six, seven minutes more for the last case. Yeah, we'll. So, see the x ray. Right, so we'll go straight to the. Uh, uh, straight to the. Uh, this is a TKR done six months ago. One of my patients fell at home, uh, hypertensive and we can get the x-rays and this is really what she had. So uh, this is a closed fracture, uh, hemodynamically stable. Uh, there's literally pulverized bone, elderly patient, osteoporotic, osteopenic, any takers for uh, any takers? I think the choice is, the choice is pretty much straightforward tumor prosthesis here, I think. Yeah. Yes. Okay, tumor I, prosthesis, I, I anyone? Also. Yeah. Think of a tumor prosthesis. Yeah. Okay, because the tumor moment you try to remove the femur, you know, the whole bone will go and, you know, you will not be left with much because... I, 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 I have, a, I have I, a quick in, in these, uh, in case, I mean, I was, I'll always have a tumor process there, but I'll put a, a nail from the, uh, from the distal femur that aligns yeah. it, that aligns it, and then I use a nail plate device. I don't know, you, we have written it right. up. Uh, so we use the nail to center it, so it reduces without me opening anything. I don't touch any of the soft tissues or the bone. Just through the intraarticular region, we put a nail in, so it aligns it, and then we put a plate. But of course, if there's no bone for the plate and the nail to hold, uh, yeah. you'll have a tumor process. But I find all right. so uh, so mm -hmm. great great points, all of them. Tumor prosthesis, uh, nail. So. You don't need to jump to a tumor, you know, you have these plastic augments with a link yeah. and you can get away with it, yeah. Right, so that's another option. So we uh, we have, if you can go to the post-op uh, uh, picture, uh, uh, Para, thanks. So he, in this, we've actually used um, a TM augment. We have used a long stem. Uh, we have used a rigid, rotating hinge. And in comminuted fractures, we have, actually at times used up to three TM augments stacked like a sick kebab. We thread the uh, augments uh, using a long uh, 220, 240 uh, stem. And we take this the comminuted bone around it and we have actually, again, our article has just been accepted for publication on uh, the role of stacked TM cones. It is remarkable at almost 12 to 14 months, the entire lower end of the femur is completely reconstituted by, you know, trabecular bone. Um, it is an excellent uh, augmentation device. It uh, stimulates osteogenesis. And uh, these patients uh, are functional. They walk very well. Um, and um, so this is really what we did in this patient. Of course, we used one TM cone. We have wrapped the community bits of bone around it. Uh, this lady is now, I think about seven or eight weeks, very recently done. I think we did her sometime in the end of Mar end of February. So we still don't have long-term data on it. Um, but um, at our last follow-up, which was about uh, three weeks, four weeks ago, her stitches are out, wound is healed well, and she's doing reasonably well. So hopefully maybe at some future point in time, we'll give you the follow-up x-rays of this patient. But we have now almost about 23 patients of severely comminuted lower end femurs where we've used up to three cones with excellent reconstruction of the distal bone. So did you use uh, allografts or how no, did you? Uh, get... we, no, so we used the same comminuted bone. We just, when we removed the, the femoral component, obviously everything just came off. There was just a mush of bone. We just wrapped that around the femoral cone, around the trabecular metal cone. And um, you know we thread the um, thread the uh, the femoral implant through the cones, get a good proximal um, metaphyseal fix. Sometimes we will use uh, 280 stems, uh, 
uh, go up to the isthmus at times, and it gives us excellent fixation. And uh, we allow weight bearing typically at between yeah. 10 to 12 weeks that stimulates osteogenesis. And we haven't had a single failure yet. Our longest follow up on this is now about seven years. Uh, we have published this initially in the um, Journal of Knee Surgery and then again in the seminars in arthroplasty. Uh, so we are really, really sort of uh, so, great believers so in this. You, philosophy how do you explain, principle. you know? So, uh, how do you explain that the load in the metaphyseal area is in the initial period relying only on the cement on your commuted bone pieces and the stem which is holding it? So the loads are pretty high. So, you know, how do you prevent early failure? What are your tips and tricks in this? So we keep them, we keep them strictly non-weight bearing, Parag. The, uh, if you look at literature data and lab data on trabecular metal cones, uh, there is enough fibrosis at between three to four weeks, which is a stable fibrosis. It stimulates fibroblasts and osteoblasts. And in a matter of about three months, there is enough cancellous bone reconstruction, reconstitution around the TM cones. Uh, we've actually had one patient where uh, who had an osteoblastoma or what was biopsy proven to be osteoblastoma. And unfortunately for this patient at about seven months, he came back with the recurrence and when we biopsied it, it turned out to be an osteogenic sarcoma. So we actually had to go back in and remove the TM and everything. And at seven months, this TM was completely covered with reconstructed and reconstituted bone to the point that the osteogenic uh, sarcoma had actually even infiltrated into this. Uh, so at seven months, there was excellent reconstruction. You need to protect these joints in terms of articulation for a period of at least about four to six months. So um, in principle, it works very well. These are very, very difficult and challenging situations. Um, but the taste, uh, the acid test is in the, in the taste of the pudding. As I said, we have six year data on this, uh, on this philosophy. Uh, we would like to wait for another couple of years and publish our long-term data at about eight years. But so far, we have not had a single failure. How easy was it to remove the TM process? I mean, that's something scared. I get scared. Of. How do you remove it? Is it easy? Or? Uh, you, you can cut through it, uh, Jacob. You can cut through it. The only thing is there's a lot of fragments that go all over the place. Make sure it doesn't hit your eye or your system side. You cover it with a wet uh, swab gauze. They're easy to cut. They, they, they are very malleable. Uh, so, I'm getting a message, carry home message. So, I will go back to where we started off uh, with what Sachin did so elegantly. Uh, constraint is a great option. We need stability. Stability comes through constraint. The philosophy is use the minimum constraint that will give you the maximum stability. That can be in reusing a CR knee, a PS knee, a dish. Um, mid-level constraint, a rotating hinge, TC3, or various forms of uh, hinges. So on that note, I'd like to thank uh, Parag, uh, Sachin, and uh, the ski sure. team. Uh, thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure. Look forward to further interactions. So thank you. I think uh, that was an excellent uh, uh, presentation of cases. A lot of messages were uh, brought about I want to thank all the panelists. I want to thank Vikas. I want to thank uh, Adarsh Reddy from Sunshine Hyderabad. I want to thank uh, Sharan Patil. Uh, we also had Mukesh Ladda, Vijay Bose, Jacob Vargas, and Bhaskar also joined in for a brief time from UK. So thank you all the panelists. It was great to have uh, all of you and excellent cases. And Sachin, you spoke really well. You set the platform very well for uh, Rajgopal sir and I think the experience spoke here. You know, all of us know Dr. Raj Gopal is one of the giants in revision, and we could see, you know, the mastery he had over the subject. So, thank you, Dr. Ashok, sir, for uh, all the nice cases, and thanks to all the panelists. So, over to uh, Ashok for quick comments. Uh, Ashok. Thank you, you Parag. Have... Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So, uh, we have Ashok. Any brief comments? Anybody else wants to say anything after Ashok? They are welcome. Ashok. Yes, sir. I think the ski webinars are attracting a lot of people. Even today, we 
we couldn't advertise as much as we did last time, but we still have 1900 people online with us. Wow. So that is a very good uh, number for ski webinars. So I think it's a very good venture for ski. Yes, yeah. uh, the, the problem now, Ashok is so busy that he cannot advertise enough. So Ashok, <laughs> take less on your plate. Don't take so many. Is it more than the other webinars or is it the same? It's quite, quite more. All our ski webinars are reaching 2000. Fabulous, yeah. No, I think it's been a great platform for the ski as well. Uh, I think first time everybody is coming to know about this uh, yeah. ski and yeah. it's a fabulous way to go, I think, Ashok. For all such in all of you doing a great job, I should say. Yeah. Yeah, well done, well done, folks. Hello, really kudos to the ski team. Yeah. Thank you. And Sachin, any concluding yeah, comments before we sign all off? All Sachin, the next uh, session. I think this was a fantastic uh, webinar. If you ask me, uh, theory is good, which is what I did. But I think to show it in practical cases, it is not everybody's cup of tea. You need. Uh, you know, giants like Dr. Ashok Roj Gopal, who have uh, a wealth of experience with thousands and thousands of cases. And I think when all those principles that we talk about are sort of uh, seen in practice by with his results, I think it talks volumes. Uh, and I think thank you, Dr. Ashok Roj Gopal, for being a ski founder member and supporting us wholeheartedly. So thank you very much again. Thank you. It's a pleasure, Sachin. Thank you. Thank you. Very much. God bless. Uh, something more. Sorry. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, we have something more. Okay. Take is it? But it is. <laughs> <laughs> Happy birthday, Sharan, sir. <laughs> For Sharan. Thank Happy you so much. Corona <laughs> beer. Party <laughs> starts now. Party starts now. That is, Ashok, that is a very quick one. <laughs> Thank you so Lovely. much. Wonderful. A good virtual Thank party. You. <laughs> Sharan, the next key meeting is on you. The it's hosted by Sharan, dinner. absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank Thank you. Bye. Once again, happy birthday. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.